Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. It looks like uh, we have a popular topic today of preparing your socks to store. Um, and you know, automation orchestration is, is incre increasingly important for security operations professionals and uh, we have yourself and, and a lot of your colleagues here today. I'm just going to wait um, a few seconds to let a few more people trickle in and, and get settled. Um, and then I'll quickly um, introduce myself and my co-presenters and we'll get started on today's presentation. A little bit of housekeeping items first. Um, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, um, there's a, a questions from the audience um, a box that, that you can enter your question in. We'll be addressing questions at the end of the presentation. We've set aside uh, 10 minutes for that. Um, and if there are any audio or video issues that you're having, um, you can also ask me and I'll try to address them during the webinar. So my name is Alex McLaughlin. I'm the Director of Marketing here at D3 Security. I'll be co-presenting with my colleague Stan Engelbrecht, who is our Director of Cybersecurity Practice, and our expert guest, David Monahan of Enterprise Management Associates. Um, you know, at this time, I'd like to uh, hand the presentation over to um, Stan. He can introduce himself, and, and, and David can introduce himself, and then we can uh, hit our agenda and, and get moving uh, with the topic today. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Engelbrecht. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity Practice here at D3 Security. Uh, so a little bit of my background. I've been in the security field now uh, coming up on probably over over eight years and just have been privileged to uh, be involved with a number of different uh, groups. We're based out of Vancouver, British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada. And uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been my pleasure to uh, take part in various, various groups in terms of ISC Squared chapters, as well as uh, helping out uh, in, in various uh, security forums here in British Columbia, such as B-Sides Vancouver's for one, and uh, BC Aware Week. So with that, uh, David, would you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and then tell us a bit about yourself as well? Sure. Thanks, Dan. So I've been with EMA uh, about five years now as an analyst. Prior to that, I spent 20 years in operations. So I've been around the block a few times. Started out doing outsourcing operations for about 10 years and then another 10 years as a CISO for a number of public and private corporations. Really enjoy security. Uh, scarily enough, I'm not sure which one of us looks older now, so I have to, I have to go back and, and you know, check that out. But uh, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to work with you guys today, and I really enjoy the sore topic, so I'm really excited to dig into this. Uh, the next thing I think we'll do is we'll start by looking at some of the key observations that I've made in preparing for SOAR and hit the agenda and some things like that. So with the, uh, with the key observations, I, I think that it's important to note that the SOAR has a lot of functionality that can deliver. And, and right now, uh, at, at kind of the cost point we're looking at, we've got a lot of the, the you know, very large, large and mid-sized organizations and, and enterprises looking at that uh, because it can add a lot of value. And, and, a, and a lot of what it does is, is around dealing with the lack of resources and skills that we have and trying to automate uh, a significant portion. In fact, you can automate virtually anything with these tools uh, to, to help yourself get through identifying uh, incidents, processing the incident, and ultimately responding to that incident as well. So, so the automation there is quite key. That's not the only aspect, but I think that's what a lot of the folks are doing because you can, you can actually save quite a bit of money uh, by leveraging these tools to augment, again, that staff perspective, the, uh, the skills perspective, and, and then get through faster. And, and if, if you haven't read any of the papers on this, uh, there's definitely an issue with the sooner you can respond to an incident, the less it will cost you in and of itself, right? Versus, you know, if you can, so if you can respond to it in minutes, the, the, the threat of damage or the perspective of damage uh, is much lower. It may be zero compared to if you don't, you know, aren't able to deal with it for a couple of hours or, or even longer. So, so the ability to, to move things through faster is, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty cool, actually, I think. Uh, a lot of the common use cases you get around that, you can see on the slide, right? We, we talk about phishing and how to deal with the response to phishing, uh, especially trying to handle SIM alerts and, and adding context to those via different tools so the, the operator themselves doesn't have to go out and do things manually. That's a huge uh, help for, for automation as well. Uh, and then when, you, when you're doing that, you're gaining additional context from the various tools and data sources that you're pulling from uh, to ex uh, accelerate that uh, that incident response. Now, uh, when you look at SOAR, uh, I put this in red because I think it's important. The full automation is still rare. We have kind of the difference between automated and automatic. Uh, a lot of organizations, uh, I think, uh, well, every organization needs automated. Uh, 
where the system will go through, gather information, uh, put it together in a presentable form, and then stop and say, hey, Mr. and Ms. Analyst, can you please uh, make a decision? Here's all the information I have. At that point, the, uh, the analyst presses a button, and more stuff happens and information comes back, right? And so there's gates, human gates in that process. Fully automatic is where, you know, you, you have Skynet or whatever, and, and you push a button uh, to, to start it. And once it goes, in terms of initializing the system, it's going to then start acting on its own and doing as much as possible, and then coming back and saying, hey, this, this uh, situation happened, here's what I did, and here's where we are. But there's no human interaction to deal with that. And, and people really aren't comfortable with that for the most part, uh, and, unless they've done this operation manually many, many times and, and proved it out. And then they might move it over into the automatic bucket where the system will go through, take care of business, and, and tell you at the end of what's going on. So you know, there's a lot going on. Stan, what, you know, what do you guys see in this area? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, you pretty much hit it dead on there. In terms of like some specific use cases, versus autom automatic versus automated, um, people, people for at least from what we've seen from our clients, they will tend to start on the automated side rather than the yeah. full automation side of it. And it's, it, again, you, you don't necessarily want to, you know, you have those use cases where if you've done them over and over again, it's it, they're, they're low hanging fruit. They're the mundane tasks. They're the ones that really should be should be and can be automated completely. Um, but still, you need to get an analyst uh, involved at some point to go and make that that particular decision. Uh, you know, one of the use cases we had, which we'll go into greater detail, is uh, is, is a phishing case where you know the it's a, it's a bit of an overload and an alert coming in. Um, and they have to deal with it, but there's still the danger that they have to go through because if they automate the process completely and block something that they shouldn't have or take some something off the network that they shouldn't take off, you can run into even a larger business issue at that yeah. point. And that, that's where that's where it becomes a little bit, um, you know, we have to tread carefully in, in that yeah, regard. Yeah, we call that the CLM, right, the career limiting move. Yeah. None of us want to be yes. there. <laughs> Uh, absolutely, uh, and I think uh, we'll head over to our agenda now, and we'll just uh, we'll we'll go through this, and we'll talk. We'll, we'll just give everyone an overview of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to look at really what's required for preparing your SOC for automation orchestration, because um, you know what we've found so far is it's not just as straightforward as downloading, installing a tool, and 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 you're up and going. There, there's work that really needs to be done there by the SOC people to really understand what what's required. Um, taking a look at prioritizing the critical business requirements. And this is important because you really want to be able to um, have this as part of the step. In other words, you know, it's great that you're going to automate a process, but how is that going to, first off, um, affect the business? And how can you report on that? How can that become part of the, your compliance report upstream? Um, so that you have to kind of build in these, these particular items as well. Uh, use cases. This is probably one of the most important parts as well, is understanding where your use cases are for automation and orchestration. Uh, you, you need to understand those processes before you, you know, before you jump full blown in. You know, what, what can you automate out of the hop that's going to give you the biggest um, ROI? Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about phishing because it tends to be for the vast majority of, of companies, it's sort of the number one attack vector in that area. And it's usually the one that's overwhelming socks a lot. Um, and w the reason you want to really create the use case is you want to be able to show, you know, the time savings, what the cost saving is going to be, so that those particular people that may not care a whole lot of that, you know, okay, we're getting overwhelmed with phishing alerts, um, that care in the fact that, okay, well, how come we spent, you know, like $300,000 trying to go and in, in time on our analysts um, remediating phishing attacks and what we can do to, to save that. Um, again, evaluating SOAR capabilities and tools, we're going, to look at, we're going to look at that, how that fits into your environment and, and what you should be looking for. And, uh, and lastly, sort of the down low on lessons, uh, on lessons learned. Um, and, this is, you know, and, and this is where things become important. Um, we're going to be spending about the next 40 minutes going over, over top of these things. Uh, we're excited to, to bring this topic to you and, and hope that uh, hope there's lots, going to be lots of questions in the end and things that, um, that we can move. So, Let's move ahead, and uh, David, we're going to start with uh, setting expectations, and, and I'm going to hand this, this one over to you. 
So yeah, I think this is the, the precursor of the of the whole event. What are you expecting to get from it? What do you want to gain? And, and I think this is important because if you if you don't understand where you're trying to get to, right, that that can affect how you define your requirements, which we'll talk about in some other things. Uh, it also affects potentially which which vendor you'll choose, and even more so, I, I think it's important because it, it helps you define the scope of the whole project and program to get this going. Uh, in addition to that, as you as you look at these particular items, uh, if you if you don't understand where you want to go, I think it's easy to kind of get divergent and, and, and end up in the wrong place at the end. So some of the things that we put up here as examples, you know, are you trying to streamline your alert handling? Are, are you trying to focus on compliance aspects and reporting and consistency in, in, in how you uh, look at and measure and respond to areas that deal with compliance? Uh, are you trying to improve your collaboration between your various organizations? We, we see a lot of issues that are out there with uh, team and tool and data silos, so it, it, maybe that's something you guys have a problem with and that's something you want to address. Uh, of, of course, accelerating incident response and resolution, that, that's a pretty common one as well. Uh, and the last one is, is trying to define and report on those detailed SOC metrics. You know, how, how can you uh, structure the information and the, and the operation flow so that you can better report on where the, the stalls are in the process or where the gaps are in the process. So each of these is, is really important. And there's others as well. Right? This is just a, a small sampling of what you may be trying to do, but all of these are important to look at. And so I think that, uh, you know, and, and thinking about that, let's look at the, the next steps we gotta, we've got to go to and, and how we're going to look at documentation and things like that. So go ahead, Stan. Yeah, yeah I'll take over this, this particular one. Um, I do do a lot of work uh, specifically with clients and, and directly into their socks. The, probably one of the best things I can tell you this particular point here where, you know, number one, query your analysts you really have to have an understanding of where your analyst pain points are. Um, understanding, you know, what, you know, what are their main, their, their mundane tasks. Uh, you know, as an example for that, we had a, we, um, a few weeks back, had, we had a phone call with a SOC lead who had actually sat down and calculated out how many hours his team was cutting and was, was spent cutting and pasting between different tools. And that, it was a staggering number. His, in, in one week, his, his SOC was spending 35 plus hours a week uh, just cutting and pasting between different tools. So that's not analyzing, that's not anything else. It's, it's a huge time sink. If, if there's a way that that process can be automated between tools, uh, you know, you've got a really quick ROI. And we're not talking about, you know, um, automating a huge amount of processes. This is maybe just a few tools that, that need to speak together and, and, have a, and have an area, a platform where you can bring all this intelligence together. And, and so talking to your SOC analysts and, and finding out what their issues are really can help the automation make a really tangible um, solution uh, right out of the box. Um, you know, uh, David, you pointed out again in the beginning, you know, full automation is rare. While a lot of it gets sold on full automation, I think it's really important to point out that when you are looking at this, you need to understand where automation is going to fit best into your SOC when you, as you're moving forward and what you can leverage yep. uh, there at that particular point. Um, a second point here is mapping your processes, process, processes to tools. Uh, what we've discovered um, oftentimes is really understanding how your tools fit into your processes. Um, and you know what? Oftentimes when, when you start building into a, an incident response platform and you start putting your processes and tools into, these, into this area, you start discovering uh, inefficiencies or areas where your tools you know, should be matching up and they don't with the flow. So don't be surprised that as you are mapping these processes into a tool, items are going to change. Uh, your processes yep. are going to change and your workflows are going to change. Um, nothing stays stagnant. I have found very, very few socks that I've worked with that after the first month of in implementing a tool like this, that they haven't changed their processes and, and, the, and their workflows. It just, it, it's one of those things that until you actually start really mapping these things, you're not going to see where, 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 you're, where you're working with. Um, and the last point here is silos. And, and David, I think this is, this is a great one for you to talk about with your background. So I'm going to hand over the silos to you here. Yeah, I think that uh, I'm going to talk to your last point first, and I'll hit the silos as well. But I, but sure. I think that the, the problem we have with automation is not understanding where we want to go and also understanding how our processes work, which is why you, you're absolutely correct in that the processes will change once you start automating them. But if you, if you try to automate things very quickly without understanding or you don't have the, the process documented, uh, I've seen organizations go off uh, in a total wrong tangent. You'll get to the, you'll get to mm -hmm. the end point faster, but it's still the wrong end point, right? So, so that's very important yeah. to make sure you've documented those processes well before you start trying to add the automation. They don't have 
be perfect, but they need to be understood. Uh, and so with the silos, uh, th this is where we have a huge gap. Oftentimes, stuff gets thrown over the wall. So maybe the uh, security guy sees something, and this is the problem. Oh, but we don't own that. We have to pass that off to the, uh, the IT operations guys to do some kind of patch or whatever. And if it's not properly handed off, it goes over the wall, sits in a queue somewhere, no one sees it, and then, hey, guys, did you, you know, you don't understand the scenario, right? So yeah. the yep. silos between these various operations, it's very important to be able to address those. And then, uh, and that will save you huge amounts of time. And again, that's probably where one of your processes is going to change over time as you automate, get it into their process faster. Uh, and data silos are another aspect, right? We want to get the data move mm -hmm. together to be provide context uh, as quickly as possible. And if you're having to copy and paste like the one example you gave, that's going to be a huge time sink, as, as you said. So so yeah. data silos are, are, a, are a problem as well. I think SOAR can solve your, your tool silos issues in a lot of cases, and they can solve your data silos issues. The political silos, unfortunately, with people that are knuckleheads, you'll have to solve your silos <laughs> outside of the scope of, of what's going on. Um, so true. Yeah, and so there's a few other things that we can consider as well. Right on uh, on that aspect, we've got uh, you know the business requirements. You, have you have you documented what you do? And we kind of mentioned it before. But then again, do you do what you document? And I've seen plenty of organizations that I've come into and worked with that ha you know here's the process that's documented. Says the manager and the guy behind us going, dude, we don't do it that way. What is going on? Right? And and so <laughs> people have evolved the process beyond what the original documentation was and and haven't uh, properly uh, updated the documentation. Which means the new guys have to learn it from the people that are already there. They can't look at the documentation. So if you, have, if you have a written playbook and it's out of date, you're hosed, right? And that's one of the aspects yeah. that SOAR can really, really help us with because the, the thing that you have in the SOAR program is the thing that's actually being run. So that playbook is going to operate the same way, and then that's when you'll identify the problems and stuff like that. But especially it's important to document. We've got a number of bullets here on it. You know, audit and compliance, absolutely that has to be done as, as mm -hmm. the first thing because if you're, if you're screwing up on that, you're going to get dinged by a third-party auditor, and you may have to stop doing business, which is not acceptable. Yeah. Uh, Service-level agreements, very big thing as well. We want to make sure that we understand how quickly we we have to respond, and of course, SOAR is designed to automate processes, accelerate, and, and deal with that kind of a, a situation in many cases in, in terms of how quickly you respond and how quickly you address the issue, H how you create your KPIs and, and report on those, uh, how, you, how you report back on uh, accreditation and compliance to your industry standards to maintain certifications, right? Because if you have an ISO certification and you deviate from the things you've documented, you've just gone out of compliance with that, that uh, certification. Uh, we, we've already mentioned team workflows and handoffs, mm -hmm. information sharing information silos, very big thing. Uh, and the last thing, I think we keep hitting on this, I can kind of see this as an important aspect, right? Process yeah. improvement. When you put this into place, you're, you're going to uh, get improvements whether you like it or not. <laughs> you know? yeah. what, what, do you, what do you think, Stan? Yeah, it's, you know, I look at the overall, the overall item here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use another sort of a, another client use case to, to further uh, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, emphasize this point in terms of business requirements. Uh, SOX need to realize that they are no longer, um, they're not a silo either. Um, they, they span a lot of different departments. They end up dealing with a lot of different departments. It's, it's critical, especially in the audit compliance, service level agreement, um, and key performance indicators. These are areas where during the course of an investigation, it may move, it's, it's likely going to move beyond a SOC, especially if you're dealing with something um, like a ransomware attack or a data breach that, affects other departments and not just the, not just the SOC. Uh, oftentimes, what you document and report is going to need to go upline. You're going to need something that's going to manage your audit trail as you move forward. You're going to need something that you can actually push out of the SOC and into other departments. Oftentimes, we have clients that need, it goes from, it goes from their SOC, it turns out to be a major incident. Um, they then have to get legal involved. They have to get data privacy group involved. They have to get um, oftentimes a PR group has to get involved, um, as well as human resources. You need to have an area where all of this is going to be maintained, audited, um, and, and be able to have those handoffs uh, to move forward. And that's why, you know, again, you talked about like data silos and, and process silos. Um, SOCs have to realize that they, they're not a silo either. Like you're, you are going to be working with other departments. It's, it's critical in terms, of, in terms of the business requirements. Absolutely, yep. If we can now look, uh, maybe move forward here, um, David. I know there's a there's a slide you want to talk on. This is a again, um, you know, again prior to prioritizing these type of business requirements. 
Absolutely, and I think I think that's a very key aspect because depending upon your business requirements may affect the tool that you select. There, you know, there are competitors in the space, mm-hmm. right? And each has uh, common functionality, like you know, playbooks are very common. But how they do those, how they implement, how you structure those, and and the other features that are strengths or weaknesses are different. So you definitely want to defend your, uh, uh, you know, cr- identify how you're going to measure success because that will help you to do that. And 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 we, you know, we have some items here, whether it's reducing mean time to repair or mean time to respond, right? In this case, respond is probably more accurate. Uh, and, and, and what types of incidents are you going to automate? How much are you going to automate? Uh, and also, what's your priority? Because there's, there's, I'm sure there's you know, tens, if not dozens, of, uh, of, of uh, different processes you can, you can automate. And, and prioritizing those is important, b- both to see how, how it's going to affect the human. What's, what's low-hanging fruit? What can you do quickly? What are your most time laborious processes, like you mentioned earlier? And there's going to be a mix of those. And, and you're not going to be able to do one or the other strictly first, because that may, you know, or cause it's, that's going to affect your, your ability to respond overall. So you'll take some low-hanging fruit. You'll take some more complex processes. You'll mix them together. Uh, additionally, you know, uh, with the uh, reducing the risk of noncompliance, that, that's a big one as well. You know, you, we, we absolutely, as we know from being in a compliance-oriented uh, uh, organizations, you've got to do that uh, first almost. And I hate to say it that way, but, but a lot of times yeah. you have to do that as, as a very uh, big priority in order, in order to uh, make sure you hit those compliance requirements from that third-party auditor. If you're not in a compliance-driven organization, hey, that's actually a very freeing from a perspective of prioritization. So you can look at how much time do you spend on individual processes, which yep. processes are most easy to to uh, automate. Uh, again, combine those in and come out with the best mix that's going to be good for you. Because uh, you know, ultimately, when you buy a new tool, I think this is important. When you buy a new tool, mm-hmm. you have to show how you're you're going to produce that I O R O I and and. Uh, you know how long it's going to take. So if you take all the most complex processes in them first, it's going to push out your ability to, to report back on complete su- you know, successes. So you take a few quick hits, throw those in there. Hey, we did five processes this week, and we're still working on you know ten more, or, or you know whatever the case is. So, yeah. um, any, any comments on that, Stan? No, I mean you, you, you pretty much you pretty much nailed it. Um, those are you know showing that type of ROI out of the box is really really important. Um, you know, kind of moving forward, maybe into like an actual real-world use case uh, in terms of in terms of what we've discovered with a couple of the clients. So I'm I'm going to do a quick walkthrough here, and and um, hopefully this is this is something that we're finding is more and more common okay. in terms of an actual um, area where where they're running into trouble. So whether it's your sim, uh, I say phishing inbox here. So a phishing inbox, and we've discovered this a number of our clients. What they do is they will have their enterprise. Um, forward their phishing attempts to a particular IT inbox. It's either, that's either done through, through an automation item, and, we'll, and in, uh, in a slide coming up, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what's happening is, is that uh, the SOC is having to essentially leave uh, the platform or wherever they're logging into, um, and from there, they're getting, they're getting a phishing email. Uh, the phishing email may have items within the body of the email. They may have items within the subject line and the headers area, and as well as attachments. Um, and this particular use case here, so um, the SOC essentially was having to check the inbox. They were cutting and pasting the body and the headers off into another, into another system. They were manually downloading the attachment onto their, onto their local machines and then um, essentially sending up, um, up the chain the different IOCs. They were looking up areas in virus total and domain tools. They were then sending the file manually into um, another tool for intelligence gathering and basically exploding the file and having it come back. Um, again, then manually downloading that report onto their machine uh, via an exported HTML, and then attaching it onto their event record. Um, so I, I kind of walked through this in, in probably like 30 seconds, but, but in all honesty, this was probably taking them on average this whole thing. Now, you have to understand, there's no analysis happening at this particular point. This is all just manual items, cutting and pasting, attaching, sending to different this is all tools. Prep work, yeah. This yeah. is all prep work, and this was probably 30 plus minutes of work. In terms of in terms of an analyst time, not doing any analysis, just actually doing, um, you know, things that that manually had to be done in order to get to the point of of, of the analysis side of it. Um, if we move forward now to this process, where you know what we ended up instituting, and, and again, um, the tool set here doesn't necessarily matter. I want I want to point that out. Um, the tools that are that are involved in this, this happens to be you know tool sets that that um, some of our clients end up using, but the process is exactly exactly what we ended up automating. So this particular one, they, they deployed uh, Fishme into their enterprise. 
they click a button, and that sends essentially off to another exchange box the actual um, e the phishing email that was reported by their enterprise or their end, their end users. So you can well imagine if you deploy this to a fairly large enterprise, and PhishMe is a great product for, for, for allowing this, um, but they were getting a ton of emails into that IT inbox, uh, you know, because it, it was real simple for, for the end users to report it. So what we did is we automated the process here. So they had two different levels of socks. They have a, a triage sock, which is their sock one, and they have a sock two or a tier two sock that allows them to do more actions. So we essentially, in the D3 side of it, um, from we automated the process by syncing with that exchange inbox. We could parse out all the information, um, automatically pull the attachment and put it onto the report for them, send it off to, in this particular case, it was ThreatGrid, but I mean, take your, take your pick. We have other clients that use Cuckoo and different areas like that. Um, they could then blow the file up. The report, which was then had to be manually exported um, out as an HTML and then attached, would just come into the report in an automated fashion. At that point, um, their, their tier one, when the, by the time they got into the incident report itself in, in the D3 platform, um, they were able to open up and have everything in front of them. So there was no cutting and pasting. There was no manual process of sending anything off to another area. They could open up the report and immediately have everything in front of them. And what this allowed them to do is the tier one could then look at it and decide, you know, okay, this is likely a false positive. They close it out and they would then alert the end user. Um, if it was a true positive and there was more items that had to be done, this is where they could escalate it, uh, basically with a click of a button off to a tier two sock that would then um, be able to do other things. So they would do a little bit more analysis. But uh, from there, um, you know, it's like you said, they can, this is the step through and basically clicking a button. So if they had to, if there was a certain file hash they had to ban that was coming out of that report from the threat area, because we can parse these items out, they could send it off to Carbon Black. Uh, they were able to enable scans to see if it was across other portions of their network, um, you know, via semantic, and if they had to quarantine something again. Um, you know, I, I say the technology doesn't matter because there's many technologies out there. This one happens to be carbon black to basically quarantine the endpoint that, at that point. So sure. the, yeah, the automated process in this side really, really helped uh, save the time. And uh, if we move to the next slide, um, this is, I got yeah, a, sorry, go ahead, David. I, Did you want to? I got, I got a question. For you. We, can, we can stay on the current slide, but I have a question for you. Do you yeah, have any information sure. around how long it took them to roughly you know, to construct this? So by the time we gathered information um, in terms no, of I mean, from the, the client. Creating the model for the playbook. Oh, for the model for the playbook? Um, yeah. Basically what we did was this, uh, this model playbook was, was probably within minutes. And the reason I say within minutes is because we modeled the entire process off of their manual flow. So they had the process in front of them. We just took those steps that were, that were manual and automated them. So in okay. other words, if there was a cut and paste, it would, it would go through. So they didn't have to change anything on their side in terms of their analysis. Okay. It was the ingestion and sending off and getting the threat reports. So this was a real, a real powerful area in terms of automating manual processes to save, to save that cut and paste time. So, so what you're saying, and I, and I think this is important to bring out, and, and I, so I, I, I wanted to get this. No, is it took them, let's say, less than an hour to emulate their real-world processes in the tool here, right, in, 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 in order to save 30 minutes per email. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a huge, yeah. I mean, that's very quick ROI, you know, very quick. Uh, and not to say that all processes will be that easy. I think some are more complex, right, have more steps. They are. But, 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 but it's something like this where you know you're getting lots of email. Let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about that as well. But yeah. I, I think it's important to understand that, that looking at these numbers and thinking about that in your head, okay, 60 minutes worth of investment of time, and suddenly, you know, boom, we're able to, uh, to reduce our, our time investment significantly. So I like the comparison we have here. Look, mm -hmm. you know, we're getting the same number of emails, right? So we're judging apples to apples. We're saying we had 200 yeah. emails across the board. Uh, we still had 109 false positives, but but in the in the first catch there, we went from 10 minutes or roughly you know over a thousand minutes of time spent on false positives to a hundred minutes of time. You know I can say it different ways. Factor yeah. of 10, right? There's 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 you know all kinds of ways, but I think that's super important because we spent an hour and we got back thousands of minutes 
right? So, yes. so that's a, I think that's a, a big thing to point out. And that's, that's why this kind of a tool is so valuable ultimately. So you can look down and you drive down. I'm not going to go through all the individual items, but I think that the, yeah. that the uh, bottom line, right, the dollars are really important. So, uh, you know, you've got, you went from essentially an analyst cost per year of 144000 applied to this task in man hours, right, to $42,000. Uh, so if you think of the hours per week, which is mentioned two lines above, we're spending mm-hmm. a, essentially a quarter of the time that we can then do other value-add activities to the business. And whether that's helping with security architecture, other types of projects, uh, or investigating other, you know, other events, or even building more automation, right, to, to parlay exactly. itself. These are all, you know, super things, right? One question I have, I know we can't say the customer yeah. name. Can you tell us the customer industry in this particular case? Uh, this particular one was uh, manufacturing. Actually, there's two different use cases. One was manufacturing. Another was uh, a service uh, service provider. So we actually okay. had uh, two two different areas in this in this particular area. Which one was manufacturing? The other was service uh, service providing. And, and I, yeah, go ahead. Go, go, would you say that oh. the, that the savings in these in this area in terms of time, right, are are you know average or analogous, or is this, or would you consider this a, a, a one off in terms of how much they were able to benefit, or maybe it's even mm. lower than usual? I don't know. Um, I would I'll say hit. this is probably I'm I'm going to call it average, and, and the okay. reason being is because um, this is where again. And, and I know I'm reaching back, but this is where the business processes and really finding out where your SOC is spending time because this is not this this like this particular use case is not a complex use case. I, I want to point that no, out. No, it's not. And and yeah. yet it's a use case that over and over again SOCs have to deal with, right? If yep. they're if you know and it you know it's the I hate to say it, but it sounds it sounds hilarious, but cutting and pasting. Like um, you know, I had I want to, I I want to pay guys sixty thousand or more dollars a year to cut and paste. <laughs> exactly, and and but it's a, it's a fact. It's just a sheer fact of of how socks operate, right? They they don't have a choice. You you have to go between tools, and it's those low hanging fruit that if you can automate those processes alone, um, you're going to save an awful lot of time, and and that time is translated directly into money because you're you're paying these analysts, right? And and it's like yep. you said, you you free them up to do the things that you're really paying them for. And to do other things, so it's it's a you know I'm going to say this is pretty much pretty much average, uh, thirty thirty to thirty five hours a week. I've I've kind of pulled I've kind of pulled a number of the different clients that I have now after hearing that number uh, you know a ways back from from one of the pre- and and it's true like they they spend an awful lot of time in other tools cutting and pasting stuff back and forth. So it's uh you know it's it, I I'm going to say this is probably on this is this is a good use case for for average savings uh, of what you of what you're going to get. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's look at some product capabilities now. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. So I, I think the first one to bring up, and, and this is primarily in alphabetical order, if I remember correctly, when I put these together, but or, or, but this is also one of the key aspects of the automation uh, and the apps and scripts that you can provide. So I think this is a, a significant variation between vendors when you're looking at a vendor, uh, is to understand how you create your automations, right? how easy or difficult is it, uh, or how automated is that process in and of itself, right? or flexible, and, and then how do you get your, your custom scripts and, and other things into that? How do you integrate with the application? that you need that we saw on the previous slide we see some here uh, as well so 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 ultimately as we look at that I mean this comes down to ease of use uh, and extensibility those those are uh, the key aspect I think with with the product uh, whichever product you know meets your, your requirements uh, additionally do you, do you uh, have command line interface requirements uh, is everything uh, a, a GUI and, and and for those of you who worked in the industry for a long time you know that there are pros and cons to both right there's some mm-hmm. things you can do in the command line which can be very very helpful and quick hit boom and there's other things which are which are much easier to do in the GUI and drop and drag and, and things like that. So you do want to, I think you want to have a little bit of a, a give and take on that. And, and then lastly, does this product support custom integrations, right? So so are, yeah. am I waiting on the vendor to do everything for me? And to, oh, can I integrate with this product? Well, no, we're not there yet. It's on our list. Okay. And, and that may not be an issue for you. It may be. In many cases, as you go mm-hmm. farther, than, farther down the, uh, the, the train, right, you, you, oh, yeah, I want to buy this product, but it doesn't integrate with my SOAR. Do I buy it or not? Is, is it you know? Do I look at another product? So that's something else that'll happen as well. Is, is you want to look at, at what types of products it already integrates with, uh, and how flexible it is in terms of integrating with additional uh, you know types of, of products. Yeah. What do you think, Stan? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Absolutely. The, the, it's it's really really important here because every every sock's going to have a different tool, a different um, I guess level of skill, so to speak. And yep. and that's why like ease of use in terms of how easy you can set up the integrations. Um, how extensible are the integrations? Like, if if you've got someone who's like a guru in in, in Python scripting, um, you know, making sure that you can get their 
um, knowledge into your SOAR platform and it stays there um, is really, really important because otherwise if they end up walking, you lose that knowledge. So you want to be able to be able to yep. contain that knowledge in your system so you don't lose it if they walk. Um, but you know, if you don't have somebody who's a, who's a, who's a guru in Python, um, how easy is it to use the predefined scripts that are there? Right, like if yep. if you can, you know, if you can drag and drop them, if you can, you know, have the vendor help you set them up once, and you don't have to worry about doing the Python scripting yourself, um, you know, these are these are areas that that people have to look at in terms of uh, in terms of the the vendors that they're that they're evaluating. So, so let's look at the let's look at the the playbook aspect now, right? From, from that, so first thing I, I want to ask you, Stan, from from your guys' perspective, what is a playbook? Mm, good question. So this is a term that gets bantered around a lot in the industry. It uh, you know, playbook, run book. Um, I I kind of want to make a bit of a distinction here because I I maybe maybe it's just me. I have a bit of a different viewpoint of of what I consider a playbook and what okay. I consider like a run book. A playbook I would consider something that you should be using to um, encapsulate the entire incident from start to finish. So in other words, like let's use NIST as a standard because it tends to be uh, fairly straightforward. But if you're, you know, you've got your detect, you have your preparation phase, which really is your building area, your playbook area, um, and then you've got your detection analysis, then you've got your contain eradication recovery, and then you have post incident. So a playbook should encompass all of those areas because you should be able to go and track, you know, what is the analysis of the item, you know, and then what are you doing in terms of recovery, uh, and and those items, and then post incident, you know, what in the playbook functioned, what in the playbook didn't function. And you should have an area where you can go and, and review all these processes and have them in place and, and again, document, right? This is, again, this yep. is going to be your audit and compliance trail. A run book, I would consider, are the actions or the automated portions within the playbook. In other words, you know, it, are, you, are you blocking something or quarantining something using carbon black? Are you sending a scan out using, you know, using a vulnerability scanner or, or a network scanner? Are you... You know, is, is an, you know, are you using an automated action to reach out to a threat intelligence tool and bring in items? Those I would consider are, are run books within, uh, within an overall playbook. And that could be many different actions within a single playbook that helps you in the overall incident. So that's, that's my take on what I would consider a playbook in, in, in terms of versus like a run book or an action that's done within them. Oh, good. And I, I appreciate that input because I think that's an important distinction and question to ask when you're investigating these vendors, right? How are you defining playbook? Uh, do mm -hmm. you use the term run book instead? How do you define that? Or, or you know, so comparing them, I think, is is important. And, and as long as the, the the prospect who's looking for the tool understands that you're talking the same language, that's great. Doesn't really matter what term is used, but you just want to make sure that you're talking on common ground. So, and, and, yeah. and addressing the slide specifically, right? When we when we're looking at our our playbooks, right? That broader context context, uh, it's good, I think, to look at how you're going to construct that. And, and, the, and the, the bullets around basing this on some kind of standard, right? if, if you can do that as you create these new new processes, it may be that you have to quick hit, boom, down, dirty, and you're done. Um, but yeah. if you can think about standards, and, and I, I want to look at NIST, I want to look at IDLE, I want to look at you know whatever it is, right? There's, there's dozens of standards out there. Uh, yes. you know, uh, if you get that in place as you're building these, you don't have to go back and rebuild them to meet other requirements. And you know, to be honest, compliance may not be security, but it does help you to build a consistent means of of addressing problems. Uh, and exactly. standards organizations or, or compliance is built around standards, and so so it all kind of weaves together. Even if you're not a compliance bound you know, organization, mm -hmm. and, and then lastly, you know, you want to identify. As you, we're using your term, the run book. What what steps in that playbook can be turned into run book and automated and orchestrated, uh, and ultimately to get that that acceleration that you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. Before we go to the next slide, I want to make a, a quick uh, announcement to the audience, if, if, if I can. Uh, earlier, Alex posted a survey, and, and I've kind of been watching out of the corner of my eye. We, we don't have a lot of folks responding yet. If you haven't had a chance to respond to that, please take a look at it and, uh, and respond to it so we can address that at the end of the, uh, the webinar. A Alex, where is that on the screen? Do you know? I, I don't see it myself. Are you there? Uh, I may have caught it unaware. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks, David. Uh, it goes away after about a minute, and I'm going to relaunch it uh, momentarily here. Okay, super, super. Because it looks like we only had you know maybe a half a dozen people respond, mm -hmm. and I want to you know hit the yeah. larger audience since we've got a, a great audience today. So anyway, yeah, people, given that, I'll, I'll let you go ahead. I'm sorry. People are shy, so I think your prompting <laughs> may, have, may have helped. So so I'll they launch are. that momentarily here. All right, super. I appreciate that. So let's move on to the visual canvas and, and what's going on there in our uh, SOAR features number three. 
Sounds perfect. I think Alex is just re-enabling it, and then he'll uh, – there That's we go. Okay. I got perfect. It. We got it. Yep. There we go. Excellent. All right. So, uh, Stan, what do you think about the visual canvas and, and what you guys do within D3? Mm -hmm. So this – I think this is, a, this is a really important part of the tool because um, for as much as we like to have documentation on the processes and on our playbooks and everything else, I think sometimes having them in a visual area like this, like a visual canvas, where you can actually drag and drop the procedures down, where you can look at the process flows, where you can actually put in um, the automated steps in, in, the, in the actual flow to see how it functions, really helps define these areas. In other words, and, and, and the nice thing about this is that, like, and again, I'm, you know, we'll use our editor here, it, it, it's not hamstringing you to any type of framework. In other words, I have clients that use NIST. I have clients that don't use NIST. I have, I have clients that, you know, have third parties built out their processes. I have other clients that, you know, they have a, they, they've built their own from the ground up. They're very mature, uh, but they don't necessarily follow it an actual framework. Having a builder that allows you the flexibility to put in your own processes and your own workflows to see how they're actually functioning is so, so important. Um, and, you know, you shouldn't need any code. Uh, the area really should be like a drag and drop ability to be able to, you know, work through and look at the different things so that you're, you know, you're not coding this. It's, it's literally helping, uh, you know, the SOC leader, whoever's been tasked with doing these things, to, to understand the process flows. And, and really, um, you know, the point three, for example, like interweaving the human and machine tasks, um, give you an idea um, of laying out the processes and going, you know what, this is an area here where I can automate. I, I, should, I should be automating this particular um, gathering from threat intelligence, or I should be automating this particular scan these are the things that you'll be able to very quickly see if you if you build them out in a visual cam canvas like this. And you know, I, you know, it and again, it's something to look for, right? I mean, we're you know yeah. we're focusing on our tool, but again, if you're evaluating tools, uh, I really suggest you look at you know how easy can you lay your own processes out within uh, within within this type of a canvas area. You know, maybe we'll you know maybe from you know triggering off of that, we'll go into the sort of the evaluating. Uh, portion of it here, and, and you know, David. Again, you have a lot of experience in this area, so I'm going to hand this back over to you to talk about this one. Uh, absolutely, and I think I'll go back to your previous example. I, I think your example of the fishing case and spending 30 minutes to gather information to do that. You know, that's a pretty common situation in operations. Uh, when I was working in, in outsourcing operations, my team spent a lot of time gathering information to be able to address various incidents, and, and that was probably the most time they spent. I really wish, and since that was literally, I, I, I finished that 10 years ago, so 20 years ago is when I, actually 25 years ago is when I started. Yeah. Uh, you know, having a tool like this to be able to automate those processes, we were doing it by hand. We were using Perl, Python, whatever we could script to, to get as much of it together as possible. So, so we were thinking about SOAR then, and we had to, right? But, but it would have been nice to have a tool that actually delivered it from an out-of-the-box perspective and being able to do a lot of it uh, our, ourselves and, and uh, or not having to do a lot of it ourselves and be able to automate that. So as we look at investigation and case management, uh, I think we, we really need to understand where we're getting our information from, whether it's digital evidence, if it's physical evidence, you know, whatever the case is. And physical evidence will be harder to, to, to deal with. In fact, you're, you're probably going to have to uh, digitize it in some fashion, pictures mm -hmm. or sound or, you know, whatever. But ultimately getting getting finding where those repositories are of the evidence and how to pull the relevant evidence back into the case, right? And, and then once you've done that and you, you've got all that together, the human person makes their, uh, human person, yeah, the human makes their <laughs> analysis and then uh, moves forward and says, okay, how do I escalate this or do I need to escalate? Can I deal with this right now or is there a next step that has to go on? So that's, that's mm -hmm. another part is dealing with that seamlessly so I can click a button literally and go, yeah, I can't, I can't deal with this, right? I don't have the experience, I don't have the expertise, whatever the case is, and, you know, go, move it on. Or yeah. maybe I've done it. Let's escalate. Uh, let's move this to the next phase rather than escalating it, and we'll move it more towards completion to meet that SLA, right? And, and then lastly, uh, I think the other key bullet is to be able to uh, to track the information that you have, the exhibits, the items, the, you know, that that evidence that you have, uh, and ultimately to generate that full chain of custody. When we're talking about anything that has to go to court, chain of custody is a, is mm -hmm. a is a requirement, right? Because if you can't say, here's how it happened, here's who had it, here's who could change it, we have an audit trail of who changed it, when they changed it. If you can't say that, any good defense attorney is going to blow holes in your in your case, and you're probably going to go down the tubes at that point. Uh, you know, anytime you deal with law enforcement, you've got to have a chain of evidence and custody. So I think that's a, a big one. So let's look at some of, uh, some of the product capabilities that we think are important. Sounds good. 
scalability. Uh, any organization that buys a product should be looking at this, how am I going to use it now, and how am I going to use it in the future? So, so just like with your ticketing systems or your SIM or whatever you're dealing with out there, you can't look at it at a point in time. You have to, this is my baseline, but I'm going to assume that over time I'm going to have more incidents, I'm going to get bigger, I'm going to have you know, fewer people, more people, whatever the case is, things are going to change. So the scalability is going to be very, very important from how it's going to handle events, how quickly it can handle events, how many events it can handle, uh, and so forth. Ease of use is the other aspect in that with the, the people there. And, and is, it, is it difficult to construct a, a playbook or a run book? Is it difficult to use, uh, understand, uh, you know, access pieces of information, report on, uh, uh, things like that? So, uh, and as we look at the, the incidents themselves, right, the dynamic nature of threats, and not necessarily any particular mm-hmm. threat, but the swath of threats overall, and, and how you, you know, each, each class of threats is going to have different requirements in terms of evidentiary gathering uh, or operations or who needs to be notified or what systems need to be uh, you know, used to, to, to block, quarantine, respond, you know, whatever the case is. So you, you've got to be able to understand those tools and the fact that you know you're probably not going to have the same tools forever. You're going to add new yeah. tools. You may decide there's a better tool for one you have and you replace that, so that's going to be a, a, an issue as well. So, so ultimately, as we, as we look at all these different items, um, that's going to come into play with, with where you are now and where you're going to be in the future. Okay, so let's look Absolutely. at the the uh, the uh, architecture and scalability at this point. So we we mentioned the the scalability from the from the user's perspective primarily. I kind of touched on the scalability from an architecture, but the the architecture is is very important, right? What are you going to do to make sure that this thing can get the data it needs and interact with the systems that it needs to interact with? You know, ultimately when we uh, when we look at the way the socks operate, that's going to change over time. There'll be new new use cases, there'll be new technologies, there'll be new business requirements, and so ultimately ultimately the metrics that you're going to drive that sock on are, are going to you know, modify over time more than likely, at least in scope, if not in depth. Right? Yeah. So I, I think that uh, reporting is, is a, a very uh, important aspect, too. And I, and I brought you guys up specifically on the bullet because I wanted to ask you to tell us a little more about your strengths around reporting and what you guys mm-hmm. do there. Yeah, the, it, the reporting side of it becomes really, really important. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of funny. I was, it, I was on a call. And, uh, you know, we had, we had the analysts, uh, we had actually the whole team on, including the SOC lead and, and above. Um, we got to the reporting side of it, and, and the analysts were, you know, kind of like, ah, you know, like this, it's, it's the pretty graphs and the pretty colors. Um, but you had a totally different reaction from the SOC lead, because the SOC lead was like, no, 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 this is, this is what I need. Um, they have to be able to report up chain. They have to know, you know, what's happening in the SOC. If, if their analysts are getting, you know, overwhelmed, them just going up line going, you know, I, I need to hire three more analysts. Well, well, why? Where's your, where's your reasoning behind yep. that? If, if you don't have the ability to show them uh, via a, a report, and I, don't, and I don't care if it's a, it's a pretty color report or if it's, you know, you, you, you send up a list report or something else like that to them, you have to be able to pull the metrics out of the sock to be able to, to you know, basically go, look, this is why. This is where we're getting overwhelmed. Look, our processes are good. Here, if you want to report on our processes and how things are being handled and what we've saved so far, but we are, we we need more resources, and, and this is the this is one of the areas where um, we it's a strength uh, in 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 our product, but it it's so so important. If you're evaluating these type of these type of um, technologies, take a strong look at what the reporting capability is. Is it going to be able to help you in terms of getting the analytics up the chain to the people that make the financial decisions? To be able to help you out, um, and, you know, it's it's oftentimes things have to come from the top down. But until you sometimes show the top really what's going on, they're not going to have a good understanding of what you're actually dealing with. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it's important to to identify here. Uh, we generally buy tools for uh, from a business perspective, right? not from a, not from enterprise mm-hmm. perspective, not from the uh, the operations perspective. Uh, when we go to buy them, we have to justify them one or two ways: either cost avoidance or, or cost reduction. Right, so if you have a rec yeah. out there or a requirement out for multiple, multiple people, oh, I gotta, I gotta have more people to deal with this. Or you can buy a tool, right? That could be potentially a cost reduction if you have a, a number of people, you know, two, three, four people that may exactly. well pay for this, uh, this particular type of tool. But I think in the most part, these are the cost avoidance, right? Because I'm implementing yeah. this tool and, and I can save, you know, 75% of this person's time on what they were doing before. I don't have to get new people, so I can avoid the additional expense. And then, you know, with, yeah. with, with, with 
whenever when you're going, you can base you can create an ROI model on that. Is it going to take me, you know, instantaneous, two months, three, six years, whatever the case is? And that's a great way to go back to your management and say, okay, if I have this, I can produce these automations, yeah. I can produce this reporting, and ultimately I've saved this much time. And so here's the amount of money that I would have saved. Subtract the amount you're paying, and, and there's your uh, you know your ROI on that. Here's the amount I'm saving, and then you can send this. We normally spend over so many years or a portion of a year or whatever. So so I think that's a, a great way to go about it. Yeah, Let's look at some uh, some some product capabilities now. Perfect. So uh, I think we have a, a few key items here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any thoughts on this, Stan or Alex? I mean, I can jump in here on 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 some of these items here first. Just before uh, Alex, I think we're going to start fielding questions here just really uh, very shortly. Um, you know, like it's. You know, you got to look at different areas. If you're if you're evaluating these, these are probably some really good questions that you want to that that you want to that you want to look at. Um, you know, do they have customers in the industry? Um, yep. You know, what's the pricing model? That's also really really important. Uh, you know, be aware of, of what you're going into. Uh, one of the ones that actually I'm going to grab question three here because this one seems to come up all the time is is um, integration side of it. So you get asked, like, what happens when a vendor that you've integrated with changes their API? Uh, the short answer is it breaks. Um, if the vendor changes the API, the API calls are no longer the same. That's going to break the inter integration. Um, one of the things to do is to is you know, uh, are the integrations certified with that particular partner? In other words, um, if if the SOAR product has a certified integration with them, chances are they're going to get a heads up prior, and they're going to be right. able to you know work on that ahead of time rather than you know all of a sudden an action breaking or something going wrong with the tool. Yeah. Um, I think on that that's, one, that's an important question to ask in, in terms of, you know, how the API is run or operated with that vendor. You know, do you own it? Does that other vendor own it? Do you guys work together on it? Because there's a lot of vendors that just place them out there. They have, they have a, a publicly accessible, if you will, API or a customer mm -hmm. accessible API, but it's kind of a, a, a you know, try at your own risk kind of thing, right? We'll put it out there, but if we change it, right, that's our business, and, you know, if we get to it, great, sorry, you know. So, so you know, how is that relationship managed? Yeah, you want to have the support, right? Like, the, these, the, this isn't a, you know, like, we don't ever look at it as a, as, as a tool that we drop in a system and walk away. Like, that's not, that, that's not how this needs to work, right? Like, we're, we're all in the security space together. Um, it's, and, and the thing is, if, you know, it's, it, it's got to be, it's got to be, that relationship has to be maintained. And, yep. and that type of a team focus has to be maintained too. And whether that's, you know, you, you want, you know, if you're the SOC and you're using vendors tools, what type of relationship is that vendor um, having with you, right? Are they, right. are they maintaining relationship? Um, you know, that's, that's really, really important to look at. Yeah. I, I think I want to hit on the second bullet as well uh, sure. in terms of the, the pricing, right? So pricing models will vary depend between vendor. And, and it's important to understand how that pricing is set up before you buy a course. Uh, I think the main reason for that is you may only be intending to, to automate a very few number of processes, but I will bet dollars to donuts that after you get those first couple or three done, you're like, man, this is really cool. I want to do more. And if you're paying on a, on a per action uh, or a per playbook or whatever it is, Right, that can get more expensive. So you do want to understand mm -hmm. that because more than likely you will land and expand after you buy it, and you don't want to have to abort one because oh, you know, the pricing is too expensive, or say I can't automate this because it's too expensive. Right. So, so I yeah. think that's an important question to ask. Um, you know, on the on the other side, I, I think of of that uh, with the vendor item or with the vendor size. All the vendors in this space are relatively small. It's a relatively mm -hmm. new category. So you want to understand, uh, you know, what 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 that vendor's plans are, what their what their debt ratio is uh, and, and what their outlook is, because you're going to have to grow and change with them you know, over, over time yep. uh, and once, you, once you, you know, jump into the, into the foray with them to, to, to automate. So, so it's important to ask those types of questions, and they're hard questions, and some vendors may not want to you know, or have a policy against revealing debt and funding and things like that. A lot of them uh, have it posted out there somewhere and have made announcements, because that's mm -hmm. always a big thing when you get new funding. So I think that's important for the vendors. Yep. Absolutely. Hey guys, I'm going to jump in here and, uh, you know, we've got about eight minutes left and, nope. and we've got a handful of questions. So Super. Um, I'm going to post this question into the, the text box and I'll also, um, um, I'll also uh, talk about it and you guys can answer it. So here, here's a good one. It was right off, uh, right off the beginning of the presentation and it's what are your views on visualized scripted automation as nearly all SOAR products are in the market? versus business process automation where you include task management 
and the ability to include more robust human decision points in the workflow. So if you guys could just you know, give your um, viewpoint on that question, that, that would be great. David, do you want to, go do you want to tackle that? Um, you know what? Why don't you tackle it first, and then I'm going to tackle okay. it from the point of view of, of kind of our platform and, okay. uh, and, and talk about it. But I'll let, I'll let you tackle that one first. So I think it's important to understand the business process before you start creating all of your automations uh, because, I mean, that, the business process is what's going to drive everything else. So, so, and, I don't, and I think that if, if, if you're trying to separate those uh, uh, from, a, from an IT perspective, you're, you're probably making something of a mistake. Now, I'm not saying that every SOAR tool can automate every single uh, task. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty strong, and, and, they, and uh, they're, they're working towards that, and some can do more than others. Uh, and you can probably talk to that from a D3 perspective. But, but, but I think that it's important to actually align those two ahead of time and then begin to work down that path so you also understand which tasks can't be automated. All of the, mm -hmm. the tools out there will provide that automated, as we talked about earlier, uh, aspect where you can have a human decision point in there. Uh, the, the key thing is to make sure that your humans can see it fast enough and understand what the priority is appropriately so you're not adding in a huge weight gate there by having a, yeah. a person that has to touch it. What, what do you think, Stan? Yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good point. So I'm going to tackle it from, from just some, some experience on my side in dealing with clients. Uh, in terms of a business process automation, where like, like task management is a, is a big thing. So we still deal with clients where the SOC does not have the ability to change things like on items like firewalls, items like endpoint systems. Mm -hmm. uh, these are tasks that have to get sent out to other teams. So you still right. are going to have that delay in there, but how is that process being automated through the SOAR, through, through the SOAR product? Can you have a quick um, task that's set up for the SOAR product for the uh, for the SOC, so they can hit a button. Um, I, you know, I, I use this example because I've, I've seen it a lot of times in terms of in terms of our uh, our client base. Um, we have a number of SOCs that they they don't have the capability to grab a packet capture off the network. That is the network team's job. The NOC uh, controls all of that. They can't do it. But what they do have is they've got a different ticketing system. The SOC had to go and they would they would realize they need a network packet capture. They jump out of that tool. They jump into the next tool. They would then write their ticket up. And, and send it off, wait for the response back. When the response came back, they download the packet caption. Again, again it's, it's, it, there's a lot of manual processes in there. Um, being able to, um, we've been, there's, a, there's a task management system within the, within the D3 platform that allows that type of an integration. So you can set that packet capture task up in D3 and have it connect to that, that ticketing system automatically. So if that is a task that needs to be done over and over again for a certain alert type, Immediately on the creation of that incident within the platform, it can send that task out to that other to that other team. Yeah. And and that and and again, on the ingestion side of it, when they've actually uploaded that particular item onto their onto their event ticket for the packet capture, it immediately gets brought into the D3 process. So yep. that's where understanding again, it's a manual mundane task that can just be very quickly. Um, you know, set to have it's set to have it done. You know, in an automated fashion, where they're not jumping in and out of a tool, they're not cutting and pasting, they're not downloading. It's that time savings again. And, and you know, I keep hitting on it, but the, yeah. the point of the, the fact of the matter is, it's it's a time waster that that really can be automated. Uh, agreed. But I, I think another aspect, though, to look at the evolution that we were talking about earlier is you'll, you'll find ways to automate you didn't know before. Let's say you yeah. have that situation with, the, with you need a packet capture, and that's a network team's guy, uh, a job. If if uh, if you're uh, able to automate this to that point, maybe at that point you can say, hey, can you give us five minutes of packet capture up front when we click the bucket or button, and then it will go over to you guys to extend that out longer. Right? So we're not going to crush the network with 20 of these. And, may, and the, the tool could even say, we'll allow five of these simultaneously or whatever your number is. I'm, I'm sure I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making some of this up because I'm guessing, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that you, this could be done. So, so the security team could have you know a maximum of five captures going on for five seconds at a, uh, you know or five minutes at a time, and the, mm -hmm. the network team can then take off the rest of that and go as far as they need to go. But it may be I only need five minutes for this particular incident. I don't need you know yeah. 35 or an hour. So, so I think there's ways you can look at the automate. But I'll, I think we want to answer a couple more questions, so I'll stop there. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so what uh, the, the question displaying now, what are the most common use cases? Uh, and then I think the question is asking, you know, in addition to the common use cases, what are some of the more advanced use cases, perhaps around um, you know, breaches or, or maybe data loss prevention? Um, th those are the, that's what comes to mind for me. But, but what, what, what's your guys' uh, view, viewpoint on this? 
Uh, I, you know, I, I can grab that. I mean, it's like the use case of gain in fishing, I think, um, is pretty much common across the board. I've, I've only encountered very uh, just a handful of people that didn't have that as a, sort of their number one common use case in terms of, in terms of automating that, that type of procedure. Um, in terms of like a really complex use case uh, would be, you know, uh, I guess doing multiple things at once within an, within an environment. And this, uh, again, it, it, you know, a rare one would be, you know, if you're, if you're updating like a firewall, if you're, you know, quarantining an endpoint at the same time, if you're adding to, you know, um, you know, a blacklist within it, within, a, within a situation that becomes a lot more complex in terms of, in terms of the actions that are being done. Um, that's, that's at least my, that's at least my, my take on it. I think that endpoint response is another one and, and other types mm -hmm. of uh, forensic investigation where you need to combine data from different systems, and that happens all the time when you're doing threat investigation or threat hunting and you find something, now I need information from this, this, and this, and being able to, to, to gather those pieces of data very quickly, uh, very common use case. Yeah, exactly. Stan, uh, how many apps do we have right now? Uh, how many what? How many apps do we have right now? Uh, I'd say we're getting close to about, um, and apps go by the vendor, by the way, within, within the system. So I would say we've, we've got close to 100 different uh, vendor integrations and close to about a 400 apps within the, or actions within, within the platform itself. Um, nice. Yeah, so that's, that, that's what we're building towards. Again, um, you know, I, I, would, I would suspect that, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter the sort of vendor, but this is an area where, you know, you should be ever expanding in. Um, you know, it's a lot of work, but again, it, it's one of those things where you want to be able to meet the client needs when, when, when they come, when they come knocking. Um, Sorry. just yeah. picking, picking a new Any one. others there, Alex? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, so this one, I'll, I'll post it right away here. Can a SOAR tool work in a lab with reduced connectivity? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I'll talk in general and then you can talk about D3. So it, when you say reduce connectivity, if there's, uh, if there are tools that you need to get to that it can't get to, right, it's going to be significantly affected by that because it can't gather the data it needs. So when you say limited connectivity, if again, if it's, if it's the various tool sets or data sets, that's going to be a problem. The tool itself can operate as long as it can access everything that you want to script or, or automate within that environment. So, so uh, Stan, you got, you got any other thoughts on that? Yeah, it's those. That's that's just the um, you know. It depends on your environment, right? Like if you're running in a in a closed off intranet uh, type of area, um, you know, you, your your sort of product shouldn't be dependent solely on having you know connectivity outside of the network. Um, you know, if you've got tools that you're building within within you know a closed off environment, um, you should be able to. It, it should be able to function in there. I mean, that that should be fairly fairly straightforward. Yeah. So, uh, Alex, do you want to post that uh, survey again to collect any last results? And because and, and, we're not using the slide right now, if you want to do that, or any other questions you we want to answer. But unfortunately, the uh, the you can only hit the survey once. I've learned that today. Um, oh. You, you know, we do have one more question um, or, or comment uh, about you know uh, the attendee flag that that it's a common U.S. sales mistake to define foreign as non-US or non-North American. And, and I, I didn't want to, you know, hide the comment or anything like that. And, and I think the attendee has a point. Um, and, and the reason that we asked that question, and, and I suppose we could have asked it in a slightly better way, um, is that some of the verbiage that, that we're getting from our customers in terms of their, um, their needs with foreign development, foreign development tools, and, 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 you know, they're using that terminology specifically. Um, and, and Stan, I mean, when you talk to customers, uh, has, has this been an issue um, more recently than in the past, or David, I know um, you've been in the business for longer? You know, I, you know what, in, in all honesty, it, yeah, in all honesty, just really quickly on that one, um, it's, I would say this is, verti this is vertical specific. So it's really going to depend on the industry that you're dealing with in, in, this, in this particular one. So, you know, I agree with the comment. Um, that, that was made in the chat on it. Um, but from my experience so far in, you know, last number of years, it's been more in industry specific. 
So how secure the industry okay. has to be, obviously, if you're dealing with arms of, you know, government and stuff like that, it becomes more of an issue. Um, but you know what? Um, you know what? I, it's, uh, it's, it's a good point that the commenter makes, right? So this wasn't, the, this wasn't the thing that we were trying to... Well, yeah. I think we got to wrap up, guys. Yeah.